Good morning. I'm Twitch, the shield bearer of faith. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to do a baptism testimony. As always, none of these uh, stories are to give any credit to me or even the people that are involved. It is to give credit to the Father and His Son for the salvation that we're getting ready to talk about. However, it's very important that we talk about it. And I find that as I share these testimonials, they reach people. So, don't give any credit to anybody that I'm getting ready to mention. Give all the credit where it's belonging. In a formal line of work, for me, I had to deal with the repercussions of substance abuse a lot, a lot. It was a very common factor that violence was preceded by substance use, whether it be alcohol or drugs. It causes people to do things they would not normally do. They become violent or they become disruptive. And so therefore we got called a lot as police officers. So I had that version of experience on one hand with what alcohol and drug abuse does to people, right? But now I've got a really cool vantage point on the opposite side of what God can use those people when they have given their life to him where they had these addictive tendencies, these outbursts of anger, these aggressive lifestyles. And he uses those same people that I once would have had to arrest, but he uses them and their testimony to reach so many people. It's very cool to see both sides. And I cannot get over the fact that there are sometimes sequences of baptisms that are similar. And so it seems like a block of time where for some reason, these people that were similar enough show up and want to get baptized. And sometimes it's out of the blue. So today is the 8th of January and the last three baptisms have been since the 1st of January. All three have similarities. All three have either prior or current substance abuse issues. And as I go through these, I think you'll find that there are similarities. You know, guys, drugs do terrible things to people. Alcohol does terrible things to people. But we have to remember that when you serve the Lord when you've given your life to Christ and you've accepted salvation, that it is a trade. You give your life to get new life. And so you're bought at a price and you have things you have to do. My hands are no longer mine. My life is no longer mine. I have to do what the Lord tells me to do or I'm being disobedient. It's the way that is. So if we're not careful we can start to become just like the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes of the Bible. And recently I was reading in Luke, and you can find the same thing in Matthew. I think it's Luke 15, and then I think it's Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 through 13, something like that. Where you will find the Pharisees, who are essentially the religious elite of the day, the religious leaders of the day. And they are standing in front of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, right? They're standing in front of him and they're feeling very critical of him. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because he is eating and spending time with people that are sinners and tax collectors. That's the description that we're given. Sinners and tax collectors. You know who those people might be in our modern day? Prostitutes, drug addicts, alcoholics, gang members, politicians, maybe. People deemed unworthy, maybe combat veterans, people that are just not as squeaky clean and shiny as the Pharisees thought they were. And so what I find when I read that, because there's a rebuke that takes place, is that if I'm not careful, I can totally become just like those religious elite, where they think they're better than someone else. They're squeaky clean and shiny. They're, they're not those undesirables. And we have to resist that. Because the Messiah rebukes them. And I'm going to again paraphrase and says that he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. The ones that want to repent. 
He didn't come for the people that are well. He came for the sick because they need a doctor. We can apply the same thing to our own lives. So back to these men since the first. First one, his name is Dustin. Dustin is a good man. I met Dustin at training. I trained him in the first Waco class last year. I think it was in April. Dustin was only at that class because he won a training giveaway. And you might be wrong in thinking that that is by accident and happenstance, and it is not. Dustin comes, and he drives a truck for a living. He does the training, a very specific portion of my classes, whether I ever meant for this to be the case or not, is heavily focused on spiritual things. Because that's what God told me to put in the class. It's just the way it is. So Dustin comes to class, we talk, we hang out, he does the training, cool. No big deal. Months go by. He's got my information. He's got my number. And so he stays in contact occasionally. But more recently, we were actually talking a little bit more in depth. And I asked him about salvation. I asked him, had he given his life to the Lord? Had he ever been baptized? And we go through this whole conversation. Long story short for Dustin, he ends up being in my area at one point where he's going to be, is what he told me. He's like, hey, I'm gonna be passing through again. He's a truck driver. He's like, is there any way that we could meet up and go get in the water and get baptized? Now, it's January, guys. It is now. I said, yeah, and he was gonna be arriving on the 1st of January. It is cold. This morning, my car said it was like 34, 35. The water is cold as well. But that just doesn't matter because the reason why matters. Why are you getting in that water? So he arrives and we talk for a few minutes. We go to the water, beautiful lake, and he gets baptized. Now, Dustin is a truck driver now, but he's pretty open with the fact that in previous lifestyle, he used narcotics. He used drugs which is actually not uncommon. My grandfather was a truck driver his whole life. Using drugs as a truck driver uh, or as anybody nowadays is pretty common, but in my grandfather's day, using drugs as a truck driver was part of the trade, according to him, because it kept you awake for these long trips. Well, maybe not as much anymore. There's more regulations and all that, right? But Dustin's pretty open with the fact that at one time he was a user. And there's certain things that come with that. There's certain weight and guilt and convictions that come with that. And so some of that you've got to let go. Now, again, that's a previous lifestyle for Dustin. He's already been removed from that, which is amazing. But that's part of his testimony now that he can go and use to reach other people that I maybe won't ever reach. And if we're not careful, we'll start to think that we're beyond it or better than it. That man, that guy was an addict. Well, never had to deal with that. And we all might start getting arrogant and just be exactly like the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You might think that somehow you're cleaner or squeakier, shinier than they are. And you'll be wrong. Second guy, his name is Zach. Zach has a really fascinating story. Zach's a young guy. Fascinating story that I'm not going to share with you right now. It's, it's his. A lot of pain in that story. A lot of difficulty, especially for someone so young. I taught Zach at a different time, more recently. Part of Zach's testimony that's so amazing, though, is that just recently he was about to take some pills. He's been struggling with using Xanax. And he was just recently about to take some pills that he had borrowed from a friend. So he didn't know where they came from. And he felt something, according to him, kind of shove him on the back as he's sitting out in front of this campfire around Christmas time. And he's just feeling like he shouldn't take those pills. Come to find out, he has them tested. Come to find out, one of them pills at least has eight times the dosing of fentanyl that would be lethal. So if he had taken those pills just a handful of weeks ago, he'd have died. 
what's even more interesting is he contacted me the day after that, that moment at the campfire. And he told me, he's like, I want to be baptized. I said, great. It was out of the blue, totally out of the blue. I said, great. Cool, man. And we set a day. Do you ever think about what if? What if he didn't feel something push him from behind? Nobody was there. What if that had happened? And he took those pills. What might be different in his life? hard to tell we don't always get to know the possible outcomes of every little thing every little decision that we did but it's a big deal that we don't miss that nothing's by accident excuse me one second there we go nothing's by accident everything has a purpose so he comes up here and I ask him hey man Tell me what's going on. He tells me that testimony. Tells me a lot of other pieces of his testimony. Tells me about how much he's using this stuff where he was and how he's getting off of it. But he's kind of in the middle of getting off of it. I was like, great. He wanted to get baptized too. He's still actively, a little bit different, right? From Dustin, he's still actively working on getting away from those pills. But I'm no better, guys. I'm no cleaner. I'm no more worthy. And so we have to be careful that we don't become like the Pharisees and think that we are somehow more righteous. We have to be careful that we're not willing to go and talk with the people that are the sinners and the tax collectors of our day. So Zach was baptized. He's on a different path now. And then this one was even more random. Today, we got to go to the water with a guy that literally showed up yesterday. Showed up. And by his own admission, and he told me I could, I could use, what was the wording he used? I could use his story as bullets in my magazine, I think is what he said. He showed up randomly yesterday, told me, told me that he was using cocaine yesterday morning. And that while he was doing that, he just felt like the spirit torqued on him and twisted him up. And he said he felt so convicted and he's like, I got to do whatever God wants me to do. He's like, I want to be his hands and feet. I want to go and do the work for the Lord. And the spirit told him to get in the car and go. And he drove a whole bunch of hours. Abruptly, randomly. And ended up finding his way to me. Showed up. A guy I know found him and called me said, hey, this guy's asking for you. Now, let me tell you something. That's not really welcome. It's weird, right? Let's just be honest, right? It's weird. People I don't know showing up. He didn't show up in my house. He showed up at the office. That's not really welcome. But at the same time, I have to be obedient. And remember, I am no better no cleaner than anyone else. I've just been saved. And so this buddy of mine calls me, I hop, hop in my car, and I go, like right then. I meet this guy, and we talked for a couple hours. I asked him about life, I asked him what's going on, why is he here? And you know what's interesting is he said, he's like, I felt like I was supposed to come and tell you, many me, he's like come and tell you, that you need to not doubt. I was like, okay. And I thought about it a little bit. I was like, I'm not doubting. But if I'm being honest, guys, depending on the day, y'all probably don't see that. 
depending on the day, I do have doubts. Not about my faith, but about a lot of things. Because I'm human. I do. I'm no better than anyone else. Some of these doubts that I have, you guys don't hear. You don't, you don't get to find out about because it's this, this format, right? And I found out recently in a various number of ways that apparently even people that are really close to me don't realize that I have doubts or that I am unsure sometimes. That I struggle with stuff too. I'm no better. And so when he showed up and he's like, you know, telling me that God told him to show up and, and come and meet with me and it happened to work out. And he's like, and hey, you didn't shoot me. I was like, no, of course not. Um, we had this really great conversation and he was honest with me. He's like, I was using cocaine this morning and I threw it away and I hopped in the vehicle and I didn't know where to go. And I came here. I told him, I said, I don't doubt at all that you're supposed to be here. I also don't doubt that the Father's working on you. I said, I don't doubt that we were supposed to have these conversations. And I don't doubt that you need to get clean. That you need to get away from this toxic stuff. And he told me directly, he said, I knew this morning that if I didn't come here, I would be dead. That's what he told me. Sounds a lot like Zach, the guy I just referenced, right? Now, Zach got proof that he'd have died because he actually got that stuff tested. But for this guy, this guy's name is Daniel. For Daniel, it's a little bit different. He just knew in here that he was going to die if he kept doing what he was doing, if he kept living the life he was living, do you feel like a dead man? You just don't know it yet? So we had some pretty deep conversations. And I finally asked him towards the end of it, I said, hey, what do you think about baptism? Do you want to get baptized? He's like, yeah, I do. And he said specifically, he's like, I want the armor of it. He's like, you don't go to battle with one shoe on. He's like, if I'm going to be the hands and feet for the Lord, if I want to go do his work, whatever that work is, he's like, that's a piece of that armor. You're right, it is. It's a piece of the sequence that you have to have. So we go down to the water this morning. I told him, I said, hey, I'll meet you tomorrow morning. And we met this morning. We went back to the lake that all three of these guys have been to, that several other guys have been to. It's a beautiful spot, and it's cold. And we go out in the water, and he's got a shirt, 1776 on it. And I think he even said something like, uh, oh, that's ironic. I didn't catch what that meant. But we go out in the water, and we baptize him, and he comes up, and he's invigorated, right? Yeah, the water's cold, but it's not just the water. He's energized. He's supercharged because the Spirit's hitting him. He takes that shirt off and he throws it and he yells. Again, I didn't quite get it. I thought he was just excited. Well, apparently, it was a reference in his mind to rebellion. Rebellion against God. So he took that shirt off and threw it. And so Phelps, one of my other brothers, was telling me about this because I didn't know that, that whole sequence of thought. And Phelps brought him another shirt and gave it to him. This is someone who is still just off of using drugs. And if I'm not careful, guys, I can be just like the Pharisees. And I can say to myself, or I can let it slide where it's like, well, these people aren't worthy. These people, they're, they're drug addicts. They're users. They're a tax collector. They're a sinner. If I'm not careful, I'll forget who exactly I am. I'm a sinner too. I was an addict too. I just didn't take pills. I didn't snort cocaine. But I was nonetheless addicted. I was a porn addict. Which is absolutely... An addiction, 
What your brain does with that stuff is just like a drug. So guys, we have to be better than that. We can't allow ourselves to say that a person's not worth my time. That person's unworthy, they're unclean. Who the heck are you? Who am I to say that? Because guys, if I don't remember the fact that I wasn't worthy either, then I'm no better than the Pharisees. If you are struggling with addiction, whatever that would be, it might be food, it might be drugs, it might be alcohol, it might be porn. There's forgiveness for that, guys. And there's healing. There's also work that has to be done. However, you don't fight it alone. The enemy wins when we're alone. I think that's a lot of why the Bible has the exact testimonial about the Messiah going into the wilderness alone for a series of time. Because it shows that even then, the enemy tried to tempt even him. How much more tempted and more vulnerable will we be? Because I'm not the Messiah. I think that should tell us that we have to have a team. We have to fight this spiritual war for our minds, hearts, and spirits with an army. And no army exists with one. There's always more than one. So, with all of these guys, I make sure they got my number. And on a bunch of occasions, several other numbers are issued out. Guys that can help with the walk that they're going to have to go do. Because you know what we can't do is be in physical proximity to everyone. I can't do that. It's not possible. But just like the classes I teach, hopefully it'll be a righteous infection that goes throughout the world. If I teach one person how to render aid, maybe they'll go and teach one person. Maybe they'll go teach five people. And before you know it, there's this spider web effect, like a righteous infection. And now the world is a better place. Same thing with this. Hopefully we can save one more from taking their own life or hopefully we can hopefully witness to one more about salvation. Or hopefully we can render aid to one more person. It doesn't matter if they deserve it. Because I didn't. And the Lord saved me anyway. And he's using me anyway. Even though I have doubts too. Daniel wasn't wrong when he was saying, it's like, don't doubt. Because we all do. About something. Go forth and be baptized. If that's your next step. If your next step is to give your life to the Father for the first time. Do that. If your next step is to make a phone call to somebody you've wronged. And confess some sins and do that. You don't know how much time you have. You never know how close you are to the edge. So don't waste it. What if today is your last day? Where are you going when it's done? See you later.